Hello, everybody. Uh, we're here live for our last Q&A of 2023. I'm very excited to be here and really happy to have Sarah Cannon with us today. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, everybody. Oh, I can't see the chat, actually. So I guess maybe that's just part of being the guest here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll we'll filter out. No, no. It is. So it is. Just There's let, tons me know, of, let me know we have what's Keith going on here. Here, everyone is coming in. Um, people listening while they're driving. Um, yeah, very excited. I'm so to excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I love Kobo Writing Life, and it's just fun to be a part of it. So thank you. Awesome. Um, let us know in the chat where you're coming from. I always like to see where people are tuning in from. Uh, in Toronto, it's not too, I feel like I always start the chat with like a weather update. But it's, uh, it's not that cold. It's not snowing. Um, but we're doing okay up here. And uh, you're nice and warm in Texas, Sarah. Yeah, 65 degrees here today. So Toasty. I'm wearing shorts underneath this shirt. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Jealous. <laughs> Well, um, Sarah is a best-selling author, planning expert, and self-publishing extraordinaire. Um, and then you also have your Heart Breathing's YouTube channel and different courses where you help authors plan and prep and basically like succeed overall um, in indie publishing. So we're so excited to chat today. Um, something that we've never chatted about on the live before, um, but something that is near and dear to like the KWL team's heart is like different planning and prepping and like trying to get tips about like physical planners and um, what is best to use. Um, so we're super excited to get to chat to you today. Did I miss anything, Laura? No, I think you've got it all covered. Thanks everyone again for joining us. And I can't believe it's our last Q&A of the year. I know. It's very exciting. We have people coming in from Poland. That's super cool. Santa Fe, New Mexico, DC, South Africa. Wow. Okay. Wow. I appreciate that. Coming from all over. Um, all right. So let's get started. Oh, before I ask, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and um, we'll kind of pull them throughout and try and get to as many as possible. But feel free to just drop them in and we'll we'll try and interweave this in a, in a smooth way. Um, but let's get started. So Sarah, if anyone isn't familiar, could you tell us a little bit about your background in writing and um, just kind of how you have become this extraordinarily great planner? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Planning became a necessity, but a hobby as well. Uh, you know, I always grew up wishing there were planners that I could use. So I used to make them out of notebooks. Like how many oh. did that? Because I used to love that just three ring binders or just those 10 cent notebooks, you know, from the dollar store or whatever. I used to love um, making my own planners and drawing them out. So it's no surprise that I love them as an adult, but I, I started self-publishing back in 2010. And so I've been at this for over 13 years now. And, wow. you know, I didn't realize when I signed up for that, <laughs> that it meant being an entrepreneur as well. You know, you just think, oh, I'm going to write the books and I'm going to get them out to fans. And really the business has become so much more of an actual business over the years because there's so much more competition and there's so much more opportunity and social media has grown and all these different things. And I feel like as authors, we have so much to keep track of in our brains at all times because we're not just like a normal entrepreneur who makes a bunch of decisions about your day to day business and taxes and what decisions you want to make in your strategy. But we also have to separately have enough creativity and time to make decisions about our stories and what the characters are going to say and do and the world building and all of that. And I find that planners become such an invaluable tool for me to keep things separate, to focus myself on this is the task. Like I have one specific, this is just a notebook too. This is a B6 Stalogy notebook. And I just keep all of my story notes in here because it helps me to journal out what are my characters thinking. And so it becomes a focus tool for me because when I sit down to work in this particular notebook, it's like my mind gets triggered to say, oh, we're plotting now. We're working on the story now. And so I have multiple planners and I like to plan that way, which is not true for everyone, but it is is something that has helped me. Um, so that's kind of my, my planning story. And be, it kind of became a necessity after publishing for several years and trying to, I've just felt the weight of how am I going to figure all this out? How am I going to strategize it? And I just realized I needed tools to visually see it because I just couldn't work it all out in my brain, like the strategy and how I'm going to, which book should be released first? And when am I going to, how much am I going to write? When am I going to do this for social media? And I'm a very visual person. So it became a necessity. And probably back in 2015 is when I really got on Pinterest and YouTube and started 
looking at what other people were doing with planners and it just became like a whole personality. <laughs> oh, I think Tara I may have. <laughs> yeah, I think Tara may be frozen. Um, Okay, so we'll get Tara back in a second. Um, but I did want to share this one comment from the audience because I think it's great. Inka says, every planner I have is Sarah's fault, <laughs> which I, I will love. Take, I'll take I'll take credit for that or the blame, whichever <laughs> way. <laughs> and your team has uh, agreed with them. So I'm glad that that's uh, kind of the brand. That's <laughs> Sarah's here. fault. That's well, if I have to be blamed for something in this world, I will be blamed for too many plans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As far as uh, blame to take, that's that's one that we can all uh, agree is a good one. Um, so I guess let's start while we're waiting for Tara. Maybe we can do kind of um, a look at our planners. Um, so I guess I'll start. Um, and this is my planner that I'm using now. It's kind of a big one. Um, it's the Day Designer um, Every Girl collaboration. Um, and I kind of have like my monthly, this is October, my monthly setup with some color coding here. Um, and then I also have um, like my daily to-do list that I cross off, which is nice. And um, it also has a spot to put like my appointments as well. Um, yeah, I'm really liking it so far, but I've also had, um, I brought some of my previous planners before. I've had the Erin Condren planner before, also leopard print. Apparently I, I'm loving the leopard prints <laughs> in general. Um, so maybe I'll go back to Erin Condren next year. We'll see. Okay. You don't have your planners yet for next year? Okay, so this one technically goes until like mid 2024. Hi, Tara. Um, so I could technically keep using this one, but I just love buying a new planner so much that I know myself and know that I'm going to end up buying another one before the end of this one. I don't know if that happens to you, Sarah. I feel like that's one of the dangers of the planner community is that they launch twice a year. They'll launch their their planners in the in the summer and then again, you know, for the new year. And it's always like, oh, but I want the new design in July. But then I also want a brand new planner. I wish they'd just sell six month planners. Oh, well, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> I love them all, but I 100% I feel that pull to get the brand new planner for the new year. Welcome yeah, back, Laura. <laughs> Hi, my apologies. Having internet issues um, and then also puppy issues. So bear with me if I'm coming back and forth. So apologies it's okay. for that. So were you going through your planners? Do I have to share mine? Yeah, yeah sure. you should share yours. I, I just did mine. When I ordered this, I didn't realize it would be quite <laughs> this large um, when I ordered it last year, but I actually quite liked it. And it has... Um, so like every month at the beginning and then every week is broken down in like a little section. So I usually just use this for work and it's a moleskin, which I always quite like. Their their planners are nice. Um, yeah, I was just I was saying before we went live that I, I, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to show 2023 because it's really filthy from just being on my desk um, somehow is quite dirty. But um, I like to uh, like set goals at the start of every month or then like a couple of points that I want to hit during the week as well um, and then have them there. Um, but I'm also a note taker. It helps me like focus. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm sorry. <laughs> it feels like it's very loud in here. Um, but I like to take notes because it helps me remember things, especially when meetings or, or stuff like this. I'm In fact, I'm taking notes right now as we're chatting. Um, okay. I think that's really helpful. I'm also but I for sure bought this two months ago because I was very excited about the new year. <laughs> Yeah, I love Should it. Should I have showed my notebook? Yes. yes. Notebook too. I love the bandeau notebooks. Oh, so too. they had um, a Black Friday sale. So I bought like seven or eight of them. <laughs> so I'm stocked up for a while. But you know you're going to buy more. Like Sarah was saying, you're going to buy more next year. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, well, we'll see how far I go with these ones. Um, but yeah, I have an I, entire the closet of notebooks in my house. I just call it the notebook closet. And some of them are used that I'm just keeping. And you don't want to, you know, you don't, there's some you just don't want to get rid of. Um, <laughs> and then also there's the uh, ones that I have had for years that I just haven't written in. So 
I love notebooks as well. Um, so Team Sarah is my operations manager, Renee, and she lives in Canada as well. So she's a lot closer to you all than oh, I nice. am. But. <laughs> well, um, so my, my planners, I have, this is not, I mean, it's sort of like notebook more than planner, but I use this to track all of my story stuff. So I decorate it and I plot inside this. So oh, wow. you can kind of get an idea of, of that. And then I also track my word counts and different things like that in here. Um, so I'm always putting these in here and I'm, I like using page flags and things like that. Cause you can move them around mm -hmm. um, and you can get these page flags really cheap on, you know, any kind of office depot, or I'm not sure which office supply stores you have up there, but um, you can kind of get those around pretty easily and you can move them around. So I really like that flexibility in my planner. And then I also am switching. So this will be my main planner for next year. It's kind of okay. getting into the light, but uh, it's it's kind of a happy planner, Franken planner. And I got the happy planner expander discs for this. Those discs so are I could huge. Just, it's huge. It's like stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> I always use, I don't know if you can see any of them on on here because they're kind of up, but I always have used for years an A5 binder, which is just like a three ring or six ring, um, you know, open and close kind of binder. And I just keep feeling like I'm not reaching for it as much anymore. And I think that can be something in our planner systems too, is like um, sometimes if something feels like it's getting stale, it can be just fun to switch it up and try something new. And so this year I've just kind of created a Franken planner and it has tabs in it. So I've got one section for my like monthly goals, one for my yearly goals, and then my HB90 planner, which is the planner that I designed and sell. It's a, a printable goals planner. That's just 90 days. So I pretty much plan in 90 day segments for myself. Um, and then Laura said she had previously used Aaron Connor, and is what this is. Oh, <laughs> he doesn't like he doesn't like that name. <laughs> I love um, the Aaron this is a pretty yeah. like multicolor coil, and they do have Hello Kitty covers as well. And you can change these covers out, which is something I really like. But this is also a Franken planner, so I have taken apart like three different Aaron Condren planners and created a six month planner out of those. <laughs> Because everything has to be customized for me. I but um, yeah, I really sit and think about what's going to serve me the best. Because when I, I used, I still buy too many planners, but when I used to buy way, way more than I would use, I would always just be thinking what looks good, what looks cute, like what is someone else using? And I finally had to step back so I didn't keep spending so much money to say what's really going to serve me. Like, if you know you take a lot of notes or you know you you want to plan monthly, like what planner is going to be able like sit instead of thinking, I'm going to buy this planner and then I'm going to figure out how to use it. It can be helpful to say, what do I need a planner to do for me? And then go out and find a planner that has those attributes to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a great point is to like look at what you're actually using, because I feel like sometimes, yeah. My my notebooks used to always be like different like freebies from conference or at work or something if there was one. And then you find you're not really using them because they're probably not practical for for what you need them for. So when I got this planner, I was like super stoked about it. It was like the first time I had a big one like that. But I think that's a really good, good tip. Yeah. And there's certain attributes like we all need that are very specific to our lives. Like I know I need to see the whole month at once. So I need a planner that has a huge monthly layout so I can put lots of things in every square. Um, but yeah, it's definitely different for everyone. Um, so as we're all kind of getting ready for 2024, Sarah, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how important it is for an author to set goals and start planning. You know, I always like to caveat any discussion where I give tips on stuff like this to say, do what works for you, because I know so often podcasts and YouTube videos and we hear so many people giving advice. So it, it, take what works for you and then let go of the rest, because some people just don't work well with thinking about the future or thinking long term or making plans. They just like to go with the flow. And that's fine, too. Um, but for me, I have found it to be the most valuable process in my entire yearly system is to sit down and reflect. The reflection for me has to come first. 
what worked this year, what didn't work, how do I want my life to be different next year? And then really sit and have a process of thinking, okay, if I want my life to be different in this way. So for example, I haven't actually published a book since 2021. And that is really, really hard for me because I've focused so much of my time on heart breathings and coaching and we moved and, you know, there were a lot, we lived in Airbnbs for six months. There's just been a lot going on and I have been writing, but I just haven't finished anything. And so that taking that moment to pause and reflect and say, what's happening, really what's happening, what can I do to change it? But then also as you go into your plan for the new year, being careful that you don't plan for the person you wish you were instead of planning for the person that you are in this moment. Because I think New Year's resolutions have taught us to say, oh, I'm going to be a brand new person on January 1st. I'm going to write more words. And you know, if, if you didn't publish a book this year, suddenly you're going to publish 12 books next year, or you know, th- I'm going to finish three full books next year. And while that could be possible, people make big leaps and big changes in their lives for sure. That type of over planning or unrealistic expectations or intentions from ourselves can very quickly lead to disappointment and where we're just beating ourselves up over, gosh, another year went by and I still didn't do this, or I plan to do four books this year. And so for me, the process is always reflect and really try to get out of the noise of everybody else's expectations and just think, and try to get out of the noise in our own head. If you're somebody who beats yourself up a lot over when you didn't quite follow through, try to get out of that noise and look at it neutrally and just say on a real, like without judgment for myself, what happened this year? Was I on my phone way too much? Was I scrolling a lot? Was I comparing myself to other people? Was I just not making writing a priority or was my health really crap this year and I really had a hard time writing or I was just super distracted or I was really going through something hard. How can I support myself more next year? So it can be a matter of better habits, um, just better strategy. Look, Cause there have been years that I've looked back and been like, well, I published three books, but they were all three in completely different series. And that might not have been the best strategy to follow. So instead of beating myself up over making a perceived mistake, I can turn around and say, but how can I make this year better in a realistic way? And so for me, that, that planning and looking ahead, even if it's just a reflection and you're not actually going to plan your next year, cause that's not your style that reflection is so important. And then instead of saying January 1st, I'm going to wake up with all those new habits, say January 1st, I'm going to begin to cultivate those new habits. I'm going to begin to try and try things on. So um, in the, like in the pre show, we were just testing our tech here and um, we were talking about reading. Laura has a reading goal for the year that she's trying to meet. So we were kind of chatting about that. And so when we think about, if we want to read more in the new year and we started to think, how can I develop that habit of reading more instead of saying, well, it's starting January 1st, I'm going to read a whole book every single week. You might say, where can I logically fit that into my schedule on a daily basis? So for me, it's like, Oh, if I'm getting on the treadmill every morning, which I've been slowly building that habit. Now let me stack something on top of it and say, now I'm going to also bring my book with me or I'm going to listen to an audio book when I'm on the treadmill. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing, but it can just be slowly building that habit. Like one day a week, I'm going to get on the treadmill and I'm going to do this instead of like quantum leaping into my best self ever on January 1st. Yeah, I think the reflections are really key. That's that's kind of what I try and take from the planning is to 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 go back and see what goals you have accomplished um like one of the best pieces of advice a friend ever gave me is I guess this is about work but you could use it for anything is that um she was like maintain a brag doc so like any time that you've done something that you think is worth bragging about or like mentioning um just, just write it down and then at the end of the year you'll have like oh right in february i did that thing um so i think like planning um or like at least like journaling or, or tracking stuff like that um is super valuable um and also it feels nice to have something called a brag doc <laughs> which i like the wording <laughs> I love that too. And I, I use a Kanban board system. So part of my HB90, I, I sketch out the year. I've actually been doing this for the last few days, sketch out 
an overall, like, this is what I would love to do for the year. But when it comes to the nitty gritty planning, I always plan quarter by quarter. So 90 days at a time. And I use a Kanban board system where I put post-it notes on the wall for every single task that I'm going to complete. So it's not every word I'm going to write, but like every thousand words gets a post-it note, stuff like that. And then again, I wish you could see it, but it's, it's, I've got all my good stuff at the top of my here thing here, but I have these little jars from Ikea that I label by quarter and I just fold up all my post-it notes at the end of a quarter that got done, all the things oh, that cool. were finished. And I put them in that jar. And so all quarter, I can see them beginning to fill up and I can pull them out later. And it's that sort of like, I am getting things done. This is really working, you know, and it's that visual, again, visual representation. So I, I really like that idea. I love that. I might steal that for the projects I complete. Yeah. It's kind of cool to see like that visual representation of it. Like you said, it's very motivating. Yeah, that must be super satisfying. Um, yeah, I think that um, kind of like planning everything out um, can be like so beneficial, like we're talking about. But how do you do you ever worry about getting stuck in the like writing down your goals versus actually doing them um or like how to differentiate like you know do you need to write down every single thing um uh I know so say for me it would be like does every single project or recurring task need to be jotted down or can I just do them and then assume they're there so what would you say for authors to try and balance like um not getting too stuck in like the planning and and actually the doing <laughs> getting the doing done in, in the planner community we have a word for this it's called procrastinate planning um and one oh of my, my god and i am such a procrastinator so that is perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, one of my favorite people has um, Adrian Trent. She has a, or a Etsy shop called Procrasta Planner, et cetera. Um, and they're stickers for writers. So if you ever want to go check those out, she's amazing. Um, but I think that there is a fine line because it kind of depends 100% on your personality. But if you love to plan and you love to strategize, it can, that daydreaming, you can get stuck there. But it's like none of those plans are actually going to ever come to life if you don't actually sit down and do the work that you said you were going to do. So that's that's part for me of the 90 day planning that I like. And my process is always to set the goal as an outcome. So instead of just saying my goal is to finish the book, I'll say my goal is to make three thousand dollars this quarter or whatever. I'll put an outcome to it. And then under the projects, I'll say, how am I going to make that amount of money? Okay, I'm going to finish this book. I'm going to work on my backlist. I'm going to apply for Kobo Writing Life promotions. You know, there's going to be these things that I'm going to do to try to get myself to that. And then I will actually break them down, each of those projects, into tiny little tasks. But not everybody needs to do that. So I think it's a matter of where, how do you work best? What works with your personality? Because I think planning has to be personal. There are systems that you can tweak to work for yourself, but in the end, you just have to be willing to get in there and say, how do I work best? And you can experiment with things similar to your figuring out your writing process, right? We see what other people do. We try it on. Is it working for us or not? And really trust yourself to, to say if it does or not. But I find that a lot of people get a lot of motivation from seeing in a really minute list, like really detailed. Okay, these are the 20 actions that I need to take. And then you can check them off. And that builds this positive like dopamine reaction, this positive uh, momentum, or like moving your sticky note down the board, you say, Okay, I did that thing. And even if because sometimes when you have a big project, like, oh, I want to publish a book. We don't really have any idea how long that's going to take, how many steps are involved in it. And so when we don't finish that in 90 days or in the year, it can just feel like, well, I'm worthless and I didn't get done with the book. But the truth is, if you actually were able to see all the tiny steps that you took, oh, you actually wrote 50,000 words, you researched, you took a course, you signed up for your accounts, you got a cover artist, you did, you know, you did send this out to critique partners, like you made progress. And if you could see all those tiny little things, maybe you would be a lot more proud of yourself. And that being proud, that act of being proud of yourself can cause that momentum to keep going. Whereas the more you feel negative about, I just didn't hit this one big part of the goal. I think that can build negative momentum. So, but I, I do, I do think it's a balance because I think you can get stuck there in the planning because the planning is like, 
the, the daydreaming of the possibilities. And then the, the work is the hard, hard part. Yeah. We have some, uh, a couple of comments around it here. Jessica saying that deciding on the planner takes long enough. Um, so just have to start with what you have and then change it later, which I think is kind of key as well as to just be flexible. And like we were saying earlier, if it's not suiting you to like move along to, to other things. Uh, and then Christy's just saying she's going to figure out what does work and what does not um, and creating her own planner, which is exciting. Yeah. And there's more, more tools than ever to do that. I mean, there's, a, I use Adobe InDesign, which is more complex, but Canva, you can really go into Canva and just create, they even have templates and other things that you can use, which is really cool. Big nice. Canva fans over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Christina. Uh, Christina says she's a big fan of the HB90 system that's worked for her and has worked for the last five years. Um, and then Kat also says that it is her fourth year with HB90. Um, so can if anyone isn't uh, familiar with that, could you kind of tell us what the HB90 is? You've mentioned a little bit about how you're doing the 90 day planning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's jump in a little bit more. So HB90 stands for heart breathing. So my YouTube channel and, and my sort of author coaching side of my career is called heart breathings, which comes from a quote that is tattooed on my body from Wordsworth that says, fill your paper with the breathings of your heart, because it's really founded in this idea of you can write what you love and be passionate and also make money doing it. Um, it doesn't have to just be a business. Like you can actually make a business out of what you love and still write what you love. And so I'm always thinking about putting joy back in the center of our writing businesses. And so I started show like when I started on YouTube, I was showing my Kanban boards were in the back behind me in my videos and everybody thought, are those plotting boards, but there, it was actually my productivity boards. And so that is how HB90 sort of came to be because people asked me to share what I was doing with that. But it just stands for heart breathings, HB90 is 90 days. And it's really that process of taking some time to think about what is your vision? Like, who do you want to be in the world? Not what others expect of you, not what you're, you know, saying that you want because you're afraid of going after what you really want. But what, you know, what do you want to be? And it can work for anybody in any goal, but it's really tailored towards writers and um, all, all types of writers. And so solidifying that vision, looking and at everything you have to do in your, in your life, like a brain dump of like all the things, because we just can't do it all. Even though we see opportunity everywhere, you just don't have time to do all of it. And so instead of spending time just barely finishing a thousand projects. Like let's focus in on what are the most important things that are going to move the needle in your career and let go of everything else and all the noise. And then we look at your time very specifically to say over the next 90 days, you don't actually have 90 days because nobody works full eight hours a day, 90 days in a row. Um, some people work more than that, but most of us have a lot less time than that. Uh, and so we really get into the nitty gritty of like, how much time do you really have over the next 90 days? And then we take that process of you set a goal, you break it down into projects, and then you sort of estimate out how long those projects are going to take you to finish. And then you compare that with how much time you have. And usually like the majority of people who go through this system find that they're putting, trying to put like a thousand hours worth of work into, you know, 400 hours or something for the quarter. And um, in that 400 hours is if you're lucky, but most people are way over planning and thinking they have a lot more time than they do. And then they beat themselves up and think they're not getting the results that they wanted because there's something wrong with them. Whereas the truth is that you're just putting like the work of five people on your plate every, every year. So that's kind of the, the system itself. And the very last part of it is to take those projects that you've decided you have time for and to break them down into small tasks. And you can do that on a Kanban board with post-it notes, but you can do it in a checklist too, or like on Notion or Trello or ClickUp or you know something like that. Um, or it can just be a checklist and a planner too. And then you go through the 90 days and then you see what, what you got done and you reflect and then you follow the process all over again. I think that's an awesome idea to consider the time that you're putting into something. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm taking that idea for myself. I think after this to, to really think about, yeah, time spent versus like what you think the time will take to get something done. Cause yeah. those aren't often the same. 
Yeah. And it, I mean, it can be hard to estimate too, because if you've never done something before, like writing a book, how do you know how long it's going to take? So it's, I think anytime you're planning, no matter what system you're using, if you are, you know, trying to figure out how much can I do this year, there has to be a little bit of flexibility in your own mind about like, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to just do the best I can. And then I'm going to learn from it. That's why the reflection is so important. And then I'm going to try to do better next time. So uh, I think two, two biggest things that hold us up when we start planning, whether it's for the year or for the next quarter or the next month, one is that we think we can do a lot more than we can just because we don't take a look at our time um, and because we see opportunity everywhere. And there's this feeling, especially as an entrepreneur, author, authorpreneur, where you see all the things people are doing to be successful. And you think, what if that's the thing that could make the big difference? Because you do see that happen. Like, oh, this person did this and now their book is blowing up everywhere. And it's like, oh, well, maybe I need to be over there too, like TikTok or, you know, this Instagram reel or this type of marketing or, you know, whatever. And it can be really difficult because there's this feeling of, because we want so badly to be successful at this, there's this feeling of, I'm already pushing myself to the max. But if I could just add this one more thing, maybe that's the thing that would make more money or the thing that would make my books famous or the thing that would, you know, put me out in front. And so it can be heartbreaking to come face to face with our own limitations of, oh, I have a full-time job. Oh, I have a new puppy at home or which sounds like such a simple thing, but it's like taking care of anyone, whether it be an animal or a elderly parent or of yourself or anything, all these things can affect how much time we actually have to spend on our writing and it can affect our focus and our ability to be creative. So I think there's a lot of challenges there that planning can help with. Um, and then the second thing is really just trying to get to know yourself well enough to know how you work best instead of trying to fit into what you think you should be doing and just really like high levels of self-acceptance. Like I know I'm never going to be the kind of person that sits down every day at 9 a.m. and writes 2000 words. And some people are that way, but it would do no good for me to compare myself to someone who does that. So that self-acceptance is important. It seems like kind of the planning mindset has like the two key things where it's like you need to be reflecting constantly on like what actually works for you and how your mind works and then also being realistic and realizing that you maybe don't have time to do everything that you want to and kind of again with that reflection reflecting on what you've actually accomplished and congratulating yourself for that and not being too hard on yourself so kind of has to be the balance of both as you begin planning. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think too, that it's, it, I mean, the reflection is super important and, and also the idea of not trying not to compare yourself to where everybody else is. Cause especially in this business, there is, there are things that we can control, but there's also luck and timing and other things we can't control. So we can do the best we can to strategize and, and put our best practices in place and all of that. But also understanding like me comparing myself to someone who like I've been self-publishing for 13 years, but I can't compare myself to somebody who took off in two years and is making a million dollars a year because they had different set of circumstances and their book maybe was in the right genre, right place, right time, hit the right chord, was so well written. Their marketing strategy maybe was different from mine, um, but trying not to take into my planning session this comparison or feeling like I need to follow a different path than what really speaks to me or what I feel like is how I want to be in the world just because I'm scared that somebody else is getting ahead or I'm getting too old or it's going to be too late. And I think that's one of the big challenges for me is like trying to show up to planning, not with too hopeful of pretending I can like, oh, I've got all these habits I don't really have, or like I can be the perfect person next year, but then also not being too hard on myself where I'm saying, oh, I should, I should be like somebody else. And those, those things can be really, I think both challenging. Especially with there being so much social media. Also, I think we lost Tara again. I know, I think she's <laughs> um, With there being so many social media channels now and people on TikTok and on YouTube showing off like 
there are different like planners and like how they keep themselves organized, it can be hard not to compare yourself. Um, and it's also hard to, oh, there we did officially lose her. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to kind of realize that this is their highlight reel that they're showing us and not necessarily their real life. Um, and yeah, we just have to kind of focus on, like you said before, what works for you um, and kind of having that progress, not perfection mindset and just try and maybe if you're starting planning for the first time, find one small thing to begin with and kind of go from there. Um, what are your tips for kind of like balancing getting writing done along with social media and marketing, especially as someone like you, who's an indie author and kind of has to do all of that. Um, it can be kind of hard to kind of prioritize everything. It is, it is really, really difficult. And I will say, I feel in so many ways, like I have been on this journey for, I started, so I started YouTube and added that to the business in 2018 and I did actually publish quite a few books between 2018 and 2021, but then some other things happened that really just put my, like, it sort of took away any extra time, like moving and having a baby that was becoming a toddler. It was more difficult to keep up with. And it was just suddenly like, I couldn't find that balance. And I think that it has been a real uphill climb to get back to it. And I'm still not hundred percent there. I wrote more. Welcome back. <laughs> I so wrote more sorry. this year than I did in previous years, but I still didn't get a book published. And so I just want to say like, if you're struggling with this, just know that you're not alone because it's not just like with, with writing or let me compare it like this. When I decide that I want to do a YouTube channel, I do, or a YouTube video, I do need to outline it and make some decisions and then get on and record it. But it's pretty much something I can do in a day. I could say, okay, this is what I'm going to talk about. I get up, I record it, I go edit it, I put it up on YouTube. It's a very fast kind of process. But when it comes to writing a book <laughs> or a whole series and you've got a whole, like there's so many decisions at play and so many things that we have to do and decide. And it's a long-term project for us. It's, you know, some people can do it quickly. Some of us, it's going to take us a year or two to finish a novel. And so I think that when we're looking for that balance, sometimes it can feel a bit frustrating because sometimes the work doesn't look like work. It is thinking and mulling it over and reading other people's books and studying the craft and just kind of living your life and trying to fill yourself up creatively. And that doesn't feel productive. And so when we're planning usually for the future, we're not thinking about that sort of refill the way well creative thinking time it's hard to put that into a schedule. Okay, I think I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to be creative from 9am to 10. And I'm going to come up with the idea for this book. And for some people, plot comes really easily, they just can get it done. And it's, you know, it's there. But for people like me, it's a struggle. And there's, I never know when the inspiration of that one idea is going to just click in my mind. And so finding that balance for me, I'm starting to realize uh, because last the past couple of years, I think what I've identified through reflection is the biggest mistake is that I'm only planning for the writing time. And I'm actually not, I'm, I'm giving so much of myself and my creative energy to helping other people, to social media, to course creation, to YouTube videos. And then I think because I have this block of time that's, you know, 9am to 11am that I'm going to be able to sit down and write. But when I sit down, there's nothing there to flow. And I can write words, but they're, for me, they kind of are still coming out not right and they're kind of empty. And so I've had this sort of uh, epiphany for myself that has been a little bit heartbreaking as well, that I am simply not making my writing a priority. And it's been a real eye-opening moment because even though I'm making the actual writing time a priority, I'm not making my own creative well a priority. And when I sit down, if my tank is empty, I have nothing to give to that story. 
it's been, it's been a real eye opener. And so I'm having to make some changes for next year. And so I think in terms of giving advice to other people about how do you find that balance when you've got social media and all the business side of it, and then you probably have a family or a partner or, you know, life outside of writing for most of us, hopefully. And then also you've got bills and, you know, maybe a full-time job. And there's a lot of things that happen is when you start to think about balance try to step away from thinking of, of it just in terms of how much time I need to spend on the writing itself and step back if you've been struggling with it and think, do I have anything to give? Am I excited to show up every day for that story? Am I, you know, am I just trying to fit my writing into the cracks of everything else? Or is my writing really a priority? Because I know there's a lot of emphasis on like ads and, uh, you know, the marketing side of things. But I, this is just my opinion. But I think for the majority of writers, even though the ads can help, and obviously, it's become kind of a crucial part of the business for a lot of people, you got to have a really good book. And it, we, I think more and more, we're getting tempted to step away from the passion of the writing and the time spent on the writing because it's become such a write it as fast as you can and just get it on the market and then throw a bunch of ads at it, um, which may be a very controversial thing to say on your podcast, which I apologize if people get angry. Um, and it, it's it, that's not the business path for everybody. Some people, that's what they want to do is create books as quickly as possible. And that's a viable way to, to do it. But for if you're like me and this resonates with you at all, um, I would really like to encourage people that feel like their writing has been a burden and a drain that when you start planning 2024, really step back and think, am I actually nurturing the creative part of myself in other ways? Like I'm not, because when we're busy, we're hustling, we're, we're thinking about the marketing, we're stressed all the time. We're scared for our own safety in terms of, am I going to be able to make enough money to keep writing? And those kind of worries take in, they just drain all creative well. And it can just be really difficult to write a book from your heart that really resonates with people when you're completely creatively drained. And so, yeah, I'm yeah gonna that's, that's a great point. And something I wanted to ask you about is like how, and maybe this is something you'll do for like 2024. How do you incorporate like thinking time or like this sort of it's almost like play time or just like the freedom mm -hmm. to to let your thoughts and imagination go like how do you put that into the planning um like I know sometimes I'll like block off a couple of hours on my calendar and I'll be like okay this is where I'm going to try and focus on this but it's ugh, I think with writers and being you have to kind of go when it is inspired for you right. um but how do you how do you integrate that into your plans I can tell you what I'm trying I'm gonna try and we'll see if it works. I have implemented some of this this year and it's working, but I need more of it. One is almost like romanticizing the writing process itself for my for myself of just being like, oh, you know, I'm going to really take the time to have my favorite cup and my favorite candle. And I'm going to sit with the room with the ambiance that I'm looking for, for a little bit and sort of invite that muse in for me before I even start writing. And then I don't put the pressure as much of like, okay, I have exactly 30 minutes and I'm going to write, you know, try to write 2000 words or whatever. I mean, that would be ridiculous. I can't write that fast. I can't. But if, you know, if you're putting that time of like, oh, I have to make the most of every moment when I'm writing, it can feel like pressure. And so the words won't flow. So kind of just like, almost like it's a date with yourself. Like I'm excited again about sitting down and writing. And then another thing is to stop filling my time all the time with my phone because it's very tempting because we have a whole world full of other things. And like, it can feel like, oh, I'm working because I'm like connecting with my fans or I'm, you know, on social media or I'm just like, I just needed a moment to zone out. But when I'm, getting my best just sort of creative ideas in the past. And I started kind of going back to thinking through this. It was always like standing in line at the grocery store, super bored in the shower, taking a drive on the treadmill, or it was conversations at dinner with my husband, no phones anywhere. We're just talking about story or 
doing things like watching other TV shows and being like, oh, that's a cool sci-fi thing. If you made that fantasy, wouldn't that be neat if you, you know, like finding that inspiration from other people's stories and letting that really fill you up. And then also uh, reading more books. And I haven't had as much time to be reading over the last couple of years. And I'm realizing how much not allowing myself to get lost in other people's fantasy worlds has also kept me from filling my own well of why I love stories so much. And so I think if we never let ourselves get bored, we never let our minds wander and our minds are just always filled with the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. I think it's adding more anxiety and less creativity into our lives in a lot of ways. And I've found myself over the last couple of years, I think maybe this is a product of, of, you know, the pandemic and going through so much there is the only way we were connected to people is through our phones and online and other things like that. And so we just got used to filling so much of our time in that way. And so now it becomes like, even when I'm just getting out of the shower, I'm already reaching for my phone and checking to see and starting some music and, or starting a podcast or, you know, something like that, even out at my son's baseball games, everybody has their phones out when that, you know, before, while everybody's warming up, everybody's got their phones out. And this is not a criticism. I don't mean it that way. I just mean that for myself, I'm not allowing my mind to wander even in the cracks of the day. And I think it's hurting my ability to write. And so that's one of the big changes I'm going to make next year. I totally agree about the boredom piece. Like, I think that is, is when people have some great ideas of like, when you're trying to entertain yourself in some sort of way, I think boredom really like feeds creativity, but we don't let ourselves get bored or it's sort of like our phone can be um, kind of like mind numbing sometimes. I mean, that's how I feel anyway, personally. Um, but Christy agrees here as well, saying um, no story on the inside means that there's no story on the page, um, which I think is super, yeah. super valid, um, but it can be a hard balance. So um, Laura, do you let yourself get bored? Yeah, I was just about to say I totally agree. I also don't let myself get bored. And I find that I don't let myself kind of sit in silence or lie in silence even. Like I always have to have a podcast on or be listening to something. Um, and that's something that I have to kind of reflect on as well. Because, yeah, it's like how am I supposed to ever think creatively if I'm just listening to other people talk all the time? or watching TV or just kind of filling up that that time that could be spent creatively. So yeah. something for us all to think about, I think. I used to ruminate on my stories all the time. I used to be like in the shower putting on makeup and I'm thinking, oh, what is Jackson going to do? And how's he like, I'm trying to, and it was exciting and fun for me. And now I, if I'm in the shower, I'm doing my makeup. I'm thinking about, oh, what am I supposed to post on social media or oh yeah, I'm supposed to get that video up today. And it's always the things that I have to do. And I think that's been a difficult part of my planning for this year is realizing if I really want next year to be different, I have to create space and I have to let go of any guilt that I'm not making the most of every moment because the way to get reignited for my writing 100% is going to be having that mental space to just think and get excited for my stories again. Yeah, I mean, I feel like no good writing comes from guilt-driven, yeah. like, <laughs> writing, <laughs> yeah. for lack like of a better term. Um, but I'm kind of curious because, so we we all showed off our, our paper planners, um, and I think there was a comment, my apologies if I've missed it, about kind of somebody moving to digital. Um, how do you balance, like, having, like, a paper planner with a digital plan um especially with i know a lot of authors have um there we go thank you laura um a lot of authors have virtual assistants so how do you align your business with that when you're physically writing everything down i wonder if you have any tips i mean i think for the most part if you're looking for something that's going to keep those birthdays and annual events you need something like iCal or google calendar those are kind of the two standard things because it's going to it's going to be no pro no productivity system that I know of, like ClickUp or Notion or anything, is going to hold on to those birthdays and things and reminders the same way. Maybe there's ways to do it. There's somebody's probably yelling in the comments, like, "There's ways, Sarah. You just don't know." Um, but I think a lot of people will combine their paper planners with their like big appointments and reminders on a Google Calendar or something like that uh, to help them out. Also, since you mentioned it. Uh, Renee came on pretty much full time for me 
And she's been working with me for a while now. And I realized if we're going to make the most of our time together and potentially be adding to the team this year, there has to be something digital, right? Because she can't see, I can't just take photos of my paper planner and she can see all my plans. And so we started using Notion. And I have some videos about how I've set that up in uh, on my YouTube channel at Heart Breathings. But I really love Notion personally. There's so many different digital things you can go with. Uh, do you at Kobo, do you guys use something like Slack or something that's for the whole team? Yeah, we use Slack and um, ClickUp as well. We've just migrated to recently. So that and then Box. So yeah, a bunch of collaborative stuff where I try and keep everything in a shareable form. So we're not having to like send each other Excel sheets um, just to yeah. avoid that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Slack is so handy for the reminders on that. I feel like I wouldn't be able to do my job well if those didn't exist. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of teams will use Slack. And the more you go toward, because authors too, it's like just setting up this appearance on a podcast, like that's that needs to go on my Google calendar because it can get lost in a paper calendar, I feel like. Um, but I like to have it in both. It's like those redundancies, because if I miss it in an email, I've at least got it written down over here, or I'm going to have a Google alert coming, coming to remind me. But I think that it, whether you want, what you want to use for your digital team or your digital planner is really going to depend on whether you have a team and you've got other people kind of relying on you. Cause you could set task blocks and, you know, calendar blocking and all like your writing time and everything in a Google calendar. But if you really want to have actual tasks then you would need to move out to something that was like a productivity system or like Google Keep or something where you can share tasks across um, a team. So I think it just sort of depends how big your team is. Yeah. And for, for people's birthdays, I don't know, maybe everyone does this, but I put them into like the contacts because you're always going to keep people's phone numbers. So that's where I add like birthdays and addresses. So when I'm sending my Christmas cards that I can send them out, um, but then you kind of don't really have to worry about it because your calendar automatically picks up the, the birthdays. Um, that's true. Yeah. I find what works for me is my phone for like immediate things. Like as soon as I book something, I put it in my phone calendar right away. And then as I'm going into the next month, I go through my phone calendar and make sure everything's on my physical calendar as well. Um, so I feel like it's a good combination of both. And yeah, birthdays. I, I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> birthdays. Um, I like that iPhone. When you text someone to say happy birthday, it also prompts you to add their birthday to your calendar for the next year. Um, so that's been helpful as well. That's nice. My family, we also set up in Google Calendar a family calendar, and we have something called Skylight Calendar, which is like a giant, it's kind of just like a giant Google Calendar that sits on your counter. <laughs> but we color code our family schedule. So like tonight, the kids have a program at school. And so that's got blue and green because we have both of our kids' colors are up there. Um, and then everything that's on my calendar is red on the calendar because George will notice it. So he knows when I've got a podcast, he knows without me having to remember to remind him like, oh, I've got a podcast. I'm going live at this time. I've got, you know, this is my writing time. Don't bug me. And so it's right there in his face in our kitchen. And that has also been helpful to share that calendar with my partner and my family so they can see what's going on. I have a, a shared calendar with my husband, um, which works, but I also got a targeted ad for Skylight the other day and I was like, this is so cool. And I can't justify it because I don't have like a, a full family right now where I maybe need all the things that you can use it for, but it, it looked really cool. So I'm definitely have that in the back of my mind. It's kind of, it's sort of like, okay, this is really just a glorified screen that can put your ca display your calendar, but you can put photos on it and kids can do chores and stuff on it. Um, and my, my son uses it for chores so that he can get uh, an allowance kind of thing. So it's been, it's been great for our family. We really like that. So yeah, and I think the way that I think of calendars with work stuff anyway is like when we're putting tasks into ClickUp, it's how can I see something without bugging the person about like, oh, what are you doing on, on X, Y, and Z? Or like, what's the status of that? So I guess mm -hmm. that's important to keep in mind if you were, um, you know, wondering what to share with a virtual assistant or anything like that. It's just uh, a space for them to be able to check in on you without maybe interrupting your writing. Yeah, that's been key for Renee and I, because 
we have come up with a flow for you. Usually on a Thursday, I'm not putting one up today, I don't think, but usually on a Thursday, I'm going to put up a new video on heart breathings. And so she, we always have that in our social media calendar on notion. And so she can always go in and see what Sarah's topic today. And she can go ahead and be creating the newsletter and some of the um, social posts and things for it. But I can just go in without messaging her and add the thumbnail and add the description and the, the text I want to go in the newsletter. And then as soon as she sees that it's there without us ever even communicating, she does it for me. And then she can click a little button that says Renee is done. And I know it's all been finished. And that has been a little bit of a work in progress to get to that point where it's not, oh, let me check in, let me check in. But when it's working well, it's so good. It's so good. So finding those sort of team team management things. Thanks. So we're we're coming to the end of our time. Um, and thank you for all of those insights. That's really awesome. And I feel like we could keep talking planners and go in depth all the time. Um, but we were going to ask you a little bit about indie publishing, but I don't think we have time to go into like um, that. But what I would say is, um, or what I would request is what is like the, the kind of one goal that you're hoping to achieve next year? Um, and what do you think would be a good goal for an indie author? So I'll just add, so that maybe that's two goals. Um, and then Laura, you also get to answer what you want to achieve next year. <laughs> oh gosh. So for myself personally, next year, it's the, the number one goal is just to get back to where I am a writer first who makes YouTube videos and helps, you know, share what I know to authors. Whereas I feel like for the last couple of years, I have been a YouTuber first or a course creator first. And my writing has been, even though I've desperately wanted to do it truthfully, just not my priority. And I'm ready to sort of flip those back around and um, get back to publishing again. And part of that, people who have are familiar with my channel will be familiar with this term, but I have a major project that I'm calling Project Phoenix, which is sort of like bringing my backlist um, back up. I'm getting everything into audio next year. There's a bunch of other, like I'm kind of fixing my blurbs and going through and doing an audit. So just getting my writing back on track 100% is my big goal for next year. And in terms of for any indie author, you know, I think this is more of a mindset goal in a way, more so than an, an action goal. But if you're going to put one thing on your list for next year, no matter where you are in your career, I think it would be so helpful for so many of us to put it back on our goal sheet to fall in love with the actual writing itself and to get back to a place where we're listening to our own inner compass instead of watching what everybody else is doing, because I think that it's adding so much noise. Learn, I guess to put it in a better way, is like learn from people as much as you can, but really check in with yourself and what you truly want and who you really want to be and what you love to write before you add that to your plan, if that makes sense. Totally. I think that's great. I think that's wonderful advice. Um, Laura, is there anything that you think an indie author should put on their goal list for next year? Oh, I was thinking about my goals for. I mean, myself. you can you can also share that. <laughs> um, I think there's so much good advice uh, that Sarah mentioned, and one thing I think for me, but also would work for indie authors, is just trying to focus on the self reflection more, um, and maybe kind of putting in place a like a once a quarter um, reflection where I can kind of look in at my goals and make any adjustments as needed, or kind of. Um, change up like my method for how I'm completing tasks if I feel like what I've been working with isn't working for me anymore. Um, so there's one for me and for authors, more self-reflection. Nice. And I think my my kind of biggest takeaway here from our chat is um, that I'm going to action is to look at the time taken to do something um, and be practical about the goals. Um, I'm terrible, Sarah. I don't know if you do this as well, but like I'll throw a bunch of goals in Q1 knowing that they'll fall into Q2, <laughs> yeah. which is not a way to achieve something if it's constantly going to move down the road. Um, so that's on my to-do list is to, uh, to think about the time it takes to get things done yeah. um, and to and hit deadlines. I will say that too, it's, it's okay to put more on your plate than you can if you also go into it knowing full well 
I'm not going to get everything done and that's okay. But where part of the danger comes in is if you're using that time estimate as part of your strategy that like, oh, I'm going to publish this and then this is going to come right here. But then this gets pushed six months, the strategy might not be as strong as it otherwise could have been. Uh, and I think sometimes that's really where we is the beating ourselves up and blaming ourselves when we can't follow through and the not being as strategic as we could because the timeline was really unrealistic. Um, but I think it's also important to say, I don't have to be perfect at this. Like, okay, there's still going to be some things on my Q1 plan that I probably won't have time for, but it gives me energy and motivation to think of it getting done. Um, so there's a balance there too. <laughs> nice. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm excited for Project Phoenix. Um, and where can people find you or follow along more um, of your journey? I know you have your YouTube channel as well. Do you want to let people know about that? Yeah, so I have kind of two of everything. So I have a, a, a Heart Breathings YouTube channel that's just at Heart Breathings. And then I also have a Sarah Cannon YouTube channel that's just at Sarah Cannon. And we do a live coffee chat. So if you've enjoyed this discussion, we do a live coffee chat every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern and where we just do Q&A and chatting and talking through things. Uh, and then I also have Instagram for both at Heart Breathings and at Sarah Cannon. If you want to check out my books, a good place to start is the book called Beautiful Demons which is the beginning of my shadow demon saga, which you can get the first three books of that series for free on Kobo. So go check that out. It's just called the beautiful demons box set. Excellent. And I think Terrence has added some uh, links in the chat there as well. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us. And thanks for all of the great comments. Sorry if we didn't get to kind of pull them up, but really, I'm um, really happy with um, the kind of chatter that's going on. It seems like you have a lovely following and community. They seem so nice. Yeah, um, lots, thank of, you. Uh, oh, lots of hearties in the chat for sure. Yeah. Popping up. Yeah. And we'll be back next month with another live event. And um, I wish everyone well in their planning for next year. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful time over the holidays. So thanks again for joining us. And thanks so much, Sarah, for, for Thank being a wonderful so guest today. Thank you so much for thanks, having me. Yeah.